Welcome everyone to the to the launch of Tourism 2025, growing value together, Whakatupu Uara Natahi. Um, hasn't taken us long to get here, has it? It's probably only, uh, I think the, the start of this project was on the 2nd of October 2012 at the TIA Summit, when some bright spark thought that we might um, benefit from having a, um, a collective view of things within the industry, and that sparked off sort of 18 months of uh, a project that um, has gone along various routes, up and down and all over the show, as it should, if it's a good process, in order to get ourselves into the right position at the end of it. Um, I particularly want to start by thanking those people who have provided such strong support um, throughout that time. Um, we could not have done without uh, the strength and commitment and vision of uh, the leaders of the industry, those who joined in um, the various groupings that we created and particularly the oversight, the governance uh, support that we received from many of the leading CEOs and, and association leaders within tourism. They were there uh, time and time again to listen to where we were getting to, um, occasionally to provide some constructive advice that set us back a month or two each time. Um, but ultimately uh, to do two things. One is to uh, make sure that ultimately we got to an end result uh, that is worthwhile. Um, Kevin's right what he said a minute ago. Uh, where we've got to is a start. That's, that's what it is. It's a good start, but this that we're entering into now is a very live situation, and so um, what we start now is something that has to be further developed and improved uh, as we keep going forward. Um, we had a project team. Uh, most of whom are sitting just over here uh, and otherwise sprinkled around the room a couple that can't be here today but uh, for a period of time there they walked away from their normal working lives um, and driven by Pavel Pavel hasn't quite made it yet he'll be here shortly Pavel Grahovich who was the consulting director to the, uh, to the project who drove us drove us really hard drove us into areas we didn't expect to, to go into uh, at times drove us absolutely nuts, um, but ultimately in the end um, his dedication and inspiration um, drove this project forward into uh, the creation of something that, that I think really matters. Um, the TIA board and the staff uh, committed themselves to this project. We had to, within our own organisation, uh, push aside to some extent a lot of our business as usual and focus hard on making sure that we had enough resource within the organisation to be part of and support the project team and to keep the overall process moving forward and then uh, for the last few months to, to put the finishing touches to this and um, there's been a huge amount of effort and dedication for those people and, and I thank them for that. Um, when, I, when I had the first crack at, at writing um, the document that's in your hands today uh, in November, uh, there was very good and consistent feedback that it was boring and um, wasn't quite hitting the mark. So, um, so I hired a fellow called Christopher Bray, who's here today. Chris is a professional storyteller. Chris actually, uh, in our first contact um, in, in this world, uh, he was the guy that came up with the concept of a stadium of four million for the Rugby World Cup. He was engaged by the New Zealand Rugby Union to assist them with their bid. And I came to know him, and um, he seemed a natural person to call on um, in order to turn um, boring words into something that is extremely readable, that makes sense, which doesn't burden people uh, with too much information, but with titillates them enough to get the idea of what it's about. And if you actually just turn to the very back cover of uh, the document that's in front of you, um, you'll see there the reference to the website. and. Uh, reference to a number of uh, documents that are created there. It would be really easy um, to overlook the importance of these, but, but if you get on the website and give yourself um, three or four days, um, you can work through uh, roughly, I think, about 10 in-depth uh, research or insight documents that ultimately uh, provided a lot of the in-depth uh, inspiration and justification for what ended up in in the headline document that's on the table today. Um, so, you know, with that, uh, thanks to those people. It, it, it's been a long, tough project in lots of ways, but it, it needed to go through the ebbs and flows in order to, to find its right place uh, where it has today. 
A lot of the inspiration um, for getting this project underway came about, um, I came into tourism and, and in, uh, coincided with with a couple of departures <laughs> and one of them was Simon Muta moving out of uh, Auckland Airport after a pretty successful time here and moving into telecom. Um, and Simon, uh, as one of his parting gestures, wrote a, a, an article um, for the New Zealand Herald about uh, what he saw tourism needing to do to, um, to make its way forward more successfully and forcefully than it had done. And it's worth probably um, going back and revisiting that. It's, it's easy to Google and find it. But um, when you actually compare what Simon had to talk to uh, about at that time with what we've put on the table today, there's a, there's a remarkable synergy and alignment with it. Basically, his message was that the industry um, needed to shake itself out, out of a malaise that had got in naturally the, the global financial crisis and other things that caused um, people to be a little bit despondent and um, frozen in some ways. And he was saying uh, it is time for the industry to get itself out of a survival mindset and into a mindset of growth. He said we had to take responsibility for doing this ourselves. We could not look at government and say to, to them, uh, you must solve our problems for us. Uh, we, he was saying basically government will provide tremendous support across a whole range of agencies uh, that exist, but primary responsibility rests with the industry itself and the best way to get the best out of government is for the industry to get the best out of itself and demonstrate that it's helping itself. Um, he said there is so much global change happening and whilst we are pretending to see it, um, we're not really accepting it and embracing it. And he said that if we can, that we would start to see there are so many opportunities sitting there for New Zealand in the future that we can embrace and that we're well placed to embrace and that we should embrace and that if we do, that's going to drive growth. Basically, his final words were adapt or wither. And that was a pretty tough message and, and I can remember at the time there was just a little bit of um, unease and resistance to that um, and he had got it right. Those who were resisting had got it wrong and for me when I looked at that, um, that was the start of a thinking process about getting this underway and I kept that article on my desktop and would revisit it about every three or four months just to remind me um, where we were coming from. And that's why I'm suggesting you go and have a look at it now because that will give you a pretty good picture how over a pretty short space of time um, that we have moved a long, long way, but we've got a long way to go. Um, what you've got in front of you today, I just want to just want to touch on three of the philosophies that, that um, fall within it. Um, you don't have to pick them up to read this. I'm going to tell you about them. The first one is a phrase we use, and it was Kevin who came up with it in one of our workshops, and it, and it says, grow volume, but grow value faster. So what we're doing, and I think this is quite a change for the industry, is that we are moving away from a traditional method of how we assess our performance, um, which was sometimes based on numbers, to a position of uh, putting up front uh, a dollar value as the primary um, indicator as to how we're going. So this figure of 41 billion is up there loud and clear on page two. And it's a daunting figure, but it is sending a very strong signal that in the end, it's the bottom line that counts. There are critical indicators along the way that matter and matter a lot, and numbers of visitors are one of those. Uh, but in the end, it's the bottom line that counts. The second uh, message or philosophy I think that is really important within this document is a strap line. Put yourself in the shoes of the visitor, of the customer. Um, this is really critical that with the changing mix of visitors that we're having, and that's not just, by the way, international visitors, it's changing within New Zealand much, much quicker than we probably realise, is that we can no longer sit there as a business and make uh, what we think are considered judgment calls about what the visitor wants without actually genuinely looking to listen to the visitor and to assess what the visitors are telling us 
and to uh, sense what are the things that are working well for us and what are the things that are causing dissatisfaction and where there are things that are causing dissatisfaction, not to sit on them and say, well, we can't do much about that, but actually is to proactively address them and start mitigating and sometimes completely removing the causes of dissatisfaction. Turning out visitors uh, at a time where uh, it is really difficult for a lot of smaller companies in particular to work out how to market themselves, and even the bigger ones that are off offshore, that's still just a speck of dust in the, in the global world of tourism. Turn the people who are already your customers into your best marketers, your best word of mouth advocates. And that's a, in terms of visitor experience, that is a very, very strong message we're sending. And then finally, um, I want to talk about the third philosophy, which I think is, is very, very important that people understand if they're going to understand the thrust of this document. And that is um, the concept of alignment. Um, probably the biggest challenge in the whole of this project was uh, having built up what we thought was some pretty deep and, and valuable insights across a whole range of areas uh, was then to work out what was the best way of signalling how the industry should move forward. And for a long time we were searching deep and wide for um, collective actions that we could put into place. Um, it took a long time to realise that in fact uh, there are some collective actions but actually the best bang for buck and the best thing that can happen for the industry um, is to develop a deep alignment in behind uh, Tourism 2025 rather than look to, across every spectrum, see people hold hands and try and move together uh, collectively. Because I think we have to face facts is that um, we love our industry, uh, we're fantastic at, at getting together and enjoying social occasions, but there is a deep competitiveness within the industry, and so there should be, um, but it exists. And furthermore, there's a diversity within the industry, which means that captured under that one little word, tourism, there are so many sectors, and so many of those sectors are light years away from other sectors, and trying to get them all to hold hands together uh, probably was likely to be a, a prescription to disaster. Instead, if what we are able to achieve with this document is to establish uh, ambition, to establish aspiration, and to establish a, a collective sense of direction as to where the industry needs to head in order to achieve growth. And if we can then help uh, those within the industry to understand that um, and to point them towards some of the help that they get within here, then when those individual leaders within their own businesses are making key strategic decisions, um, they will have the wherewithal to make decisions in their own businesses and with those close to them uh, that will line up with the aspirations of Tourism 2025 and will uh, take their businesses towards uh, contributing to the end result. And if you get one business doing that, if you get five businesses, ten businesses, if you get a hundred, uh, you'll eventually get a thousand and you'll eventually get ten thousand doing that and the collective power of that will be massive. Um, and so it is it's really something that, that I need people to understand about how this is working. It's about alignment. It's not about a whole series of specific agreements uh, across a wide spectrum. What will happen as this gathers momentum is that the ability within that alignment to create those clusters of agreements will grow and grow. But right now we have to learn to walk and we have to start and alignment's the, definitely the best place for us to start. Um, there are a lot of people, as I said, that contributed to the success of, of what we're here for today. And I just want you to, uh, over the next few minutes, uh, just hear just a small selection of, of the stories from some of those people. Um, and we'll start um, by inviting Adrian Littlewood, who's the CEO of Auckland Airport, to come forward. Um, of course, we're, we're being hosted at this venue today by Auckland Airport. Um, one of the things I've really loved uh, about the involvement in the industry is there has been people that have come in and uh, they have ambition, they have aspiration and they are prepared to start with that and backfill it to the detail 
um, that comes in behind that, rather than to limit themselves to trying to think what they can do uh, with small actions and hope that that adds up to growth. Um, and you know, we are lucky that we have organisations within the industry that are aspirational, that are growth focused, and, and Adrian is certainly leading one of those. So, Adrian, if you'd like to come forward. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the airport. It's a privilege to host you here today. You can see outside that door there a couple of our key customers. <laughs> Looking very resplendent there, Christopher. Um, listen, uh, so welcome. Um, look, it's, it is an important day, and I think, as Martin said, it marks a, a long path to get here. Um, but we're very excited about today. Uh, for us, tourism 2025 has been about setting a higher ambition, about setting a target of how we can grow faster, achieve 6% growth, and how we can... Uh, really align ourselves around the core themes that will unlock that um, pros uh, uh, potential for New Zealand. I think, but it also highlights uh, for us certainly the fragmented nature of the tourism industry and how we have to work together to innovate and achieve that growth, particularly if we are to expand our country's market share of fast-growing emerging markets. And one of those issues that was very uh, important for us, as you'd imagine, is this issue of air service connectivity. The growth in sustainable air connectivity has proven over many years to be the primary catalyst for tourism growth in different markets, whether they be domestic or international. That air connectivity, as we all know, materially adds to New Zealand's well-being. Uh, every international daily wide-body flight contributes about $140 million to New Zealand's GDP every year. And much of that benefit goes to, to all of us, the tourism industry. But I think it's important that we all recognise the commitment of an airline to fly from and to New Zealand to new markets is not a trifling one. There are millions of dollars at stake for these airlines, and the airline servicing New Zealand cannot take all the risk at home. The whole industry, as we heard on this video here, should get involved and get in behind air services development with the right support, the right product, and the investment in promotion to help the airlines fill their current capacity and therefore support future growth into the future. And I think that philosophy is embedded in the core of Tourism 2025. So for us at Auckland Airport, we're very committed to playing our part to deliver on that by working very closely with the airlines uh, to identify new opportunities, new markets and new routes. And we work with all the industries wherever we can to try and help support that with government and, and that's both in New Zealand and overseas. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. We've also been investing a lot of time and energy and working with also the industry where appropriate to design our airport of the future. It's a 30-year plan which sees, it, sees us go from 14 million passengers today to 40 million in 2044. And we think that's the right thing to do, to set a long-term path to make sure that we've got the capacity and the right um, experience to welcome all those tourists into the future. So we look forward to working alongside of all of you to deliver on tourism 2025. Uh, and I'd like to finish just by saying thanks to Martin, particularly, and the project team for working so hard on the project. I'd also like to thank uh, MB for their support. Uh, and I look forward to working with you on, on the next phase. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, when we got to the stage of, of creating the final document that's on the page today, one thing that we were wanting to do is somehow try and capture the unique distinctiveness of, of New Zealand and the tourism product within New Zealand. Um, it wasn't, we didn't have to go far to get a really good case study about this with Whale Watch and um, today Kuahi Napura is here and I just ask you Kuahi to come forward and, and say a few words. Unfortunately, um, some of us in this room still try to play rugby on Saturdays. <laughs> the, mind's, the mind's 18, but the body's not quite there. In fact, I show up in the office on Mondays and they sort of say, oh, you, you need to give it up. They're quite blunt. I hear they're recruiting for lawn bowls. <laughs> so, uh, maybe one day. Tihei uh, uruni, tihei nako nako. A whakatau hā ko te rangi te o nei, whakatau hā ko te papa i tako to nei. Ko te mori Hawaii ki e tau iana ki te kaupapa o te rā nei. Uh, the release of uh, Tourism 2025 is a major step in aligning the diversity of our industry by delivering us a framework we can collectively look uh, to work within. 
I'd like to congratulate Martin. He's going to be a, a great loss. Um, his team at TIA and all those organisations and individuals that have contributed to its development. And I applaud them all for having the courage um, to set such an aspirational goal for our industry. Uh, the five themes that have been chosen are fundamental uh, to the ongoing development of our industry. And the framework, uh, from my perspective, ad advocates for collaboration at a range of levels, which has never been more important given the size of some of the markets we are now starting to target and the, the global competition out there vying for that all-important tourism dollar. Obviously, we need to appreciate that good things take time. Uh, these things are achieved by many small steps. But if we can achieve the goal um, set for tourism 2025, our industry and indeed the wider New Zealand economy will benefit greatly. So the, the key reason I'm up here today is really just to um, congratulate Martin and everyone that's been involved um, to show that uh, Wild Watch and our, our small town in Kaikara is committed to doing what we can to support this framework. And really I just wanted to um, um, share with you uh, my thoughts around uh, part of the document that's on your table around delivering New Zealand experience. Um, ultimately that's our, um, our, um, our uh, core competency, it's uh, what makes us different. I'm at Wild Watch, we understand that we're not the only Wild Watch company in the whole world, but um, I'm yet to be, um, I could be um, challenged, but um, I don't think there's many 100% Māori and Wild Watching companies out there. Um, so that culture uh, that we can do uh, is what makes us different and gives us that competitive advantage. So just reading from the book, um, there is a difference in Wild Watch Kaikoura between what people come for and what they take away. What they come for is what it says on the box to see the whales. They want to be up close to the natural world, the adventure of being out on the ocean, the spectacle of our mountains meeting the sea. In other words, they come for what they are promised, 100% pure New Zealand. But what they take away are our values. Wild Watch Kokoda delivers a cultural experience. I don't mean hangi or kapahaka, but manaki and kaitiaki. The warmth of our welcome and our reference for the natural world. What visitors want, the reason they're here is to experience something not available anywhere else. They want a uniquely New Zealand experience. At Wild Watch Kaikoura, we know that that's not so much what we do, but rather the way that we do it. Some people call this uh, kiwitanga, but whatever we call it, it's what people remember and tell others about, and that makes it the secret for growing tourism in New Zealand. Thanks, mate. Um, I've just noticed Pavel Grahovich has turned up now. I've talked about Pavel before. Pavel, the project team is over here on their seats. Come and take one. But uh, what I did before, and I'll do it again in your presence, is to thank you for um, the drive and inspiration that you created to this project and how, um, in the end, the end result really f reflects um, your diversity of experience and your drive for excellence, and a huge thank you to you, Matt. And as I said before, one of the concepts that, that Pavel drove, drove hard in this was this, this concept of putting ourselves in the shoes of the visitor, um, in the shoes of the, the customer. And when we were looking for a, um, a case study um, for the, the document, we sealed in on, um, on a business that um, Kaylee and, and Nail Spirith uh, from uh, Time Unlimited run. And uh, I'd ask both of them to come forward and just demonstrate uh, how they make this happen within their own business. industry so what we say to our clients is tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou, haere mai ki tāma ki makaua. So um, in starting there I understand we've been asked, I'll talk on the, I can probably talk well, um, we've been asked to represent the SME market, sensational magical enterprises creating sustainable memorable experiences. That's what we believe we, our sector is about. So many of the larger companies 
Um, we never want to be the biggest, but we want to be iconic like many other SMEs in this industry. Now, our business um, is not just based, we might be Auckland based, but our tourists, our visitors travel from region to region, but they want a seamless experience. And we understand as, as a company that takes people between Rotorua, as just talking to some of the girls, some people think we live there because we're often there. Um, but it's about for the visitor in their shoes, they don't know our regions. They don't know where our city boundaries begin and end. And so our service needs to be there, seamless. Um, what I heard and what I've read from what was provided to us pre-preparation um, for this was kotahitana. It's about um, together we can achieve more. And that's, in essence, um, following on from Kauahi, um, your sort of comments about we hear a lot is being taught to our industry about kaitiakitanga, um, manakitanga, but um, in essence, it's important how we treat each other because it flows on to how we treat our visitors. And we get comments quite often, um, how I do a hongi with Kevin at Sky City Grant, give a hug to the doorman or Roberta, the head concierge at the Langham. People see that, our clients say, wow, you actually like each other. And that's actually important that people know um, that we're caring for each other. Now I've decided, because we've got five minutes, that we'd put up some, some slides there, two slides, which should give you, in essence, what we're trying to actually ensure that when people come into our organisations, whether they're our team members, our interns, or people that industry partners, that we want to give the local real. We want people to have authentic experiences, but that has the national feel to it, that it's about being a Kiwi, it's about being, you know, most people tell us about how many possums we have, and they want to, on our tours, we actually allow them to touch a fur of the possum and say to them, this becomes merino silk, buy plenty of it. So it's about actually giving them that real touch, taste, feel for the industry. The other thing is that if we do the local feel with the national, uh, sorry, the local reel with the national feel, we've got that global appeal. And I'm going to hand over to my husband to explain it doesn't start when they get into our vehicles. It doesn't start. The experience starts well before they're even thinking of coming to New Zealand. So, okay. so we're just singing too much last night with Lionel Richie. <coughs> Dancing on the ceiling and pretty hoarse. <coughs> but um, yeah, as Kelly was saying, um, that um, it starts way before the beginning of the tour. It starts when we get an inquiry from... Uh, let's say a wholesaler in Chicago, a really quick communication, giving people confidence that, that we're on, on, on the ball. And it's not, not just our business, it's all of us that are challenged with that. But in terms of visitor experience, I just wanted to say, yeah, it's straight from this document that you all have in front of you, <clears throat> our motto in our business is, we're never, ever, ever happy with what we've achieved. It's always about looking ahead. And that's why we've had an absolutely outstanding season. And in fact, next year, 2015, we already have actually currently five times more bookings than we have had 10 months out ever before. And I think it's a re um, <clears throat> the reason for that is, of course, what Tourism New Zealand is doing, TIA is doing, all of us are doing together. Um, so I believe that our, our future in New Zealand is absolutely very, very, very positive. But we all have to remember that we offer us a lot of amazing things, but other countries do too. And um, what does make us different, uh, like you were just saying, is, is our indigenous culture and integrating that wherever we can. That's where our company name comes from. Time unlimited means to integrate Maori experience. Okay? Um, <clears throat> our product markets, just very quickly, we offer Auckland tours, Maori tours, um, um, guided walks um, and a lot of private tours, which is why we work with a lot of other regions in New Zealand, um, um, Rotorua, Taupo, Northland. We take people to places that are often forgotten um, or not mainstream, like the Hokianga, a particular favorite of ours, which we absolutely love. A uh, good growth market. And in terms of the, 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 the markets themselves, our core markets that we're achieving great growth in is North America, Australia, uh, Europe, but also what we're very, very interested in, especially in the last two, three months since the Chinese have actually changed their, um, um, 
the legal framework for FIT tourists, we've actually had quite good growth from China, and that's something that we're actually working in our company on extensively. In fact, we have a staff member working for the next three to four months on creating a strategy for us as to how we as a company can get more business from the Chinese market. So it's never being happy. Um, we're very happy with what we've achieved so far, the nine years we've been around, but always looking ahead and trying to improve what we're doing. Lastly, for me, social media. <clears throat> Just again, read from this. A lot of people see social media as a necessary evil. And it's a necessary evil, of course, because we can't control it, and that's scary, not being able to control social media. But you have to believe in it. It's a real opportunity to engage with visitors, build relationships, and create advocates. This is what Kelly always says, and it's absolutely true, a relationship business. We're in the business of relationships. We're not actually just a tourism. Which it leads naturally into the next slide, and apologies, I know the rules, not many words on a slide, but we're not in this for commissions. It's about care missions to us, how we care for our clients, the people industry partners that send those clients to us, but more so how we treat each other. And so uh, what we often do in the industry, um, I'm, I'm thinking of Waitomo Rosalinds, um, they ring ahead and say, hey, these clients, you need to do this for these people. It helps us actually grow the profile of our clients. The more we know about them, we can have their, their, the right water waiting for them, the, uh, making sure we've got the step or whatever it is that will make their journey here and their experience heightened. Um, and you guys can read down there, but also I, I've just been uh, out at Piha yesterday with a Japanese group, and we want to set that benchmark. We don't want to follow always be the followers and for big companies even to Adrian we had these shirts first before your cleaning team and somebody somebody actually said to me gosh you clean a long way from town but, but um, yeah so it's it's many things you know let's, let's you don't have to somebody said, was telling me say pinch ideas I prefer to modify people's ideas in the industry why not people are doing things well let's set that benchmark Nail ran major shopping centers in Europe I had a career with Ernst & Young and I see some of my past colleagues, Stephen and, and Terry here. It's about lifting our game, which is what was great to read in this strategy. Um, why, if we're all going to go, let's all go together. Kotahi I think that's really important. We just had a restaurant we're interested in taking people to, but they've only got a B grade. And so we're helping them to actually get up to an A grade because it's got a great location. So I guess it's about us in the industry. We also want to attract good people to the industry and, and people outside the industry to come in so that we can get that insight. I saw one of the values of the strategy, get people that know are doing great things in other industries to come over to ours. My challenge is that this document gets given to those educators of tourism students and also that this becomes a sexy professional industry that people I hear so often when I get a real job when this is seasonal. This is not a seasonal business to us. We didn't win lotto. We're in this to make some money. For us, it's about collaborative, com uh, competitive models, and uh, yeah, being industry friends, but actually making some money too. Kia ora. Thanks, guys. I didn't realise Lionel Richie was still alive. <laughs> But well done. And there's a lot of inspirational stuff that you talked about there, so congratulations to you. Um, when we worked our way through this project, one of the very strong messages we got was there is real value in this being private sector led. Um, during the project process, we found roughly around 30 um, national tourism plans around the world. And um, to the best of our knowledge, the only other place in the world that had a private sector-led tourism strategy was Sweden. Um, so we are unique in that sense and it is the right thing to do because as Simon Muter indicated two years ago, the industry has to take responsibility for itself first. And if it does so, then the ability of government to help will be enhanced at a site. This government wants to help. It's a government with a big G and a government with a small G. Um, and that is what's happened during this process. The, the support we've had from public sector leaders, 
um, guys like um, Kevin from TNZ and, and Nigel Bickle from Immigration New Zealand, and Paul Stocks and Lisa Barrett from MB. Um, they have been rock solid supporters throughout this process, and I'd like to ask Paul now um, to come forward and just on behalf of MB say a few words. Thanks, Martin. It's uh, really nice to be invited to your farewell function. <laughs> I'm glad to see that uh, TIA is, you know, double tasking this. It's also the launch of the tourism strategy. Um, I don't need to tell anyone in this room how important tourism is to New Zealand. It's a huge industry, uh, $24 billion, of which $10 billion is export earnings. Uh, almost 6% of New Zealanders are employed in the tourism industry. It's also the face of New Zealand. It's what people see and think of when they come here. It's, it's what they take away in their hearts when they've been to New Zealand. So it's a fundamentally important part of everything we do, of who we are, and how we present ourselves to the world. That's why uh, New Zealand's government's investing $130 million a year in uh, export promotion through Tourism New Zealand, and that was boosted significantly last year. It's why we um, have the Tourism Growth Partnership, which is a partnership between government and the private sector to try and innovate, to try and find new ways of doing things to drive value out of the industry. And that word value is really important, not just volume. Um, it's also why we were happy to support the development of the tourism strategy. Um, and as Martin says, earlier on, um, there were people saying, government needs to have a strategy for the tourism industry. Um, best thing that can happen with the government strategy is it gets put on my shelf, um, and that's the best thing that can happen to it. It's really important that any strategy that's developed for an industry is done by that industry and has alignment and has buy-in. So it's been really good to see that. Um, TIA, under Martin's leadership, has done a fantastic job of bringing together such a diverse industry, probably the most diverse industry in New Zealand, um, with a huge sense of alignment behind it. Uh, Martin's asked me to talk briefly about Briefly, uh, about where MB fits in within this kind of partnership. Um, and there's a few things I'd want to touch upon. Um, I suppose firstly is insight, and that insight, uh, dr driving value through insight is actually really, really important. Um, we support it through the tourism statistics that we provide to industry and to, to, in terms of where visitors are going, both internationally and with the domestic regional tourism statistics. Um, I think it's really easy to forget how important domestic tourism is. It's $14 billion per year, and it drives the whole success of the tourism industry in New Zealand. Um, I was also struck when you read this document um, about how insightful insights can be. Um, there's a line in there that says, if you um, added up all the cruise ship passengers that come to New Zealand, they would be the third largest source destination country. So thinking about cruise in that context was something I hadn't thought about before, um, and I'm sure that I'll be, uh, be told to think about it a lot more often um, by the cruise industry. Um, I think secondly, uh, in terms of productivity, uh, TGP, Tourism Growth Partnership, should be a core part of that. Um, also, I thought what was really useful in, in putting this strategy together was thinking about the seasonality aspects and how to make use and best value of, of the offshoot season, the shoulder seasons, to, to really get, to, 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 uh, get value from the capital that's invested in the industry. Um, speaking of targeting for value, we are doing some things to, to help getting some value out of the industry. The cycle trails have been enormously successful. Um, and uh, from what we understand, are a, a huge source of, again, that important domestic tourism. Um, I cycle to work every day. I still haven't been on a cycle trail yet, but I'll uh, try to convince my boss that actually that's a core cool part of my job to get out there on the cycle trails. Um, uh, and the other thing we've been doing around uh, uh, value is working with China. Um, China is unusual um, for a country in that uh, their government does matter. Um, so the role that we can play to help make connections government to government in support of industry is something we take really seriously. And if there's anything we can do to help um, as Ministry of Business Innovation on point, um, you can pick up the phone and we'll be working there with NZTE, with Tourism New Zealand um, and with Foreign Affairs to do so. Um, finally, visit ex experience. Um, it's all about the visitor experience, isn't it? And as Kelly said, it starts not when you get off the plane, be it near New Zealand plane or anyone else uh, in this country, or the boat. It starts when you first think about going to New Zealand and you first think about what do I need to do. So I, that's why we've been working with immigration as part of MB, to think about how to make those visa experiences as quick and as painless and as easy as possible. Um, translating the visa pages into Mandarin, um, dealing with issues about how to get uh, Chinese driver licenses accepted in New Zealand with ease. Um, and there are those little things we can do to help, and we will do to help. Part of it is knowing um, where those opportunities arise. 
So look, I'm really uh, pleased and excited uh, for New Zealand that you've managed to put this together. Um, I think it does uh, set up the alignment for the industry. I think it's a huge testament uh, to the uh, to dedication and conviction of those who put it together. Um, Martin, I did joke about it being your farewell, but this is your legacy. Um, you've been instrumental in putting it together. You should be very proud, um, and we should all pay you a great dose of thanks. Cheers. Thank you, Paul. Despite what they say, you're a nice guy. <laughs> uh, now, uh, Paul uh, referred to it briefly, but um, I'm now referring to the role of TIA. I mean, TIA, TIA uh, stood up as an organisation uh, with this project and it made sure um, that it corralled the industry enough to get it as far as it has come. And um, that's been important to do that. We're well placed within the structure of the industry to take on that role and lead and facilitate in that area. Um, I'd now just like to ask the Chair of TIA, Grant Lilly, to come forward. And Grant, I think you're probably going to talk just a little bit about um, the role TIA will play going forward. Yeah, thanks Martin. and. Uh Good afternoon. Really, um, I wanted to just reflect on that role, but I guess in the context of really saying, you know, where to from here almost. I mean, 2025 is a way off. Uh, we today uh, are setting off on a journey that was begun, as Martin said, almost two years ago and has got to this formative stage. So where to from here? Uh, two main thoughts, and before I mention briefly what TIA is going to do, I mean, where to from here is more in your hands than in mine or ours or TIA's. I mean, really the success of this, and we've already seen some little cameos, uh, and there are many good examples coming out now, the success of this framework for tourism is going to be how every tourism business, large or small, uses this framework uh, to evolve its own plans, its investment decisions, what it does as a business in order to help deliver these objectives. And I think very importantly, as other speakers have touched on, how each business does that itself and for itself, but also does that in alignment with the rest of the industry. And so we've really got to get every business, large and small, saying, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it to play our part in developing this framework? And in a way that means we're going to be working with everybody else, working in alignment with everyone else. Yes, we'll have competitors. Yes, we'll have people we disagree with. Yes, we'll have things that are going to be issues and problems along the way but let's work on the big picture framework. So key thing I would ask you to do today, and we've only got a very small part of the industry here, but we've got some very significant people and players in that industry, is become disciples. Take what's here, adapt, adopt it, and get out there, practice it yourself and preach it, because if we all do that, it will flow. What is TIA gonna do? Well, we're certainly gonna do a few things. But the four key things that we see are our role going forward are to be curator, really, for this framework. You know, we'll be the custodian of it, and we see that TIA's got a really important role to be a disciple for it and to tell stories in the communications we have and with our members and the things we do to continue to tell stories that reflect the important principles that this framework has in place. We'll use the TIA Summit each year uh, as a platform to publish progress, take some quantitative measures, measure ourselves and then debate within the industry how are we going, are we making good progress both in quantitative and a qualitative sense and we see Tourism Summit is going to be a key annual vehicle to take the temperature and debate as a team how we're doing. We'll probably take the role of feeling we should poke and prod bits of the industry uh, or sectors of the industry that 
we don't feel are showing the right uh, commitment and enthusiasm and work with them to try and uh, stimulate that. And we will probably, as an organisation, as a member organisation, look to identify a few small initiatives that we can either lead from a cross-industry perspective or co-lead with others, MB, government, major players, etc., in order to deliver things that perhaps no single business or sector is going to do. So those are the sort of things that TIA is going to do. But as I say, I think the real success of the plan is much more in the hands of the individual businesses and sectors working on this plan. Finally, it just uh, gives me the opportunity today to say thank you uh, to Martin. So Martin leaves TIA in a week's time. And Martin mentioned a little bit about his involvement with this plan. And I think uh, we've probably all seen Martin at times uh, wildly uh, enthusiastic about it, and we've probably seen him at times enormously burdened down by it. This, developing this framework, has been a very big job, as we have heard. It's been a big job for TIA, it's been a big job to the project team, and thank you, I think it's been a big job for us as an industry to have had the debates uh, and involvement that so many of you have had. But more than anyone else, it's been a very, very big job for Martin. And he took it on and he has done an enormous power of work to get it to this stage. He's done a lot of other things with TIA and for TIA and for tourism, more numerous than I can mention today. We would have loved to have held on to you a little longer, Martin but your almost two years with us has been a very, very valuable one. We wish you all the best in your future endeavours. We know you're always going to have a little bit in your heart for tourism, and I'm sure we'll see you from time to time and we'll drag you back one way or another uh, to have a wine and uh, see how we're getting on. So it just uh, it leaves me to, on your behalf, and invite you to join me, and in a true Kiwi fashion, Today we've got probably the best opportunity we're going to have to let a group of very senior people from tourism uh, acknowledge Martin before he goes. And so please join me in expressing your thanks to Martin Stedman for the contribution he's made to TIA and tourism. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, Grant. That was really nice. And, and um, it's a little bit more than just a little bit of my heart that will stay in tourism. Um, and I've got a real stake in it now. That's what I wanted to leave with was a stake in it. This, this project was enormously important to me. Um, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I've, I've had the, the fortune um, to be in a number of different leadership roles. Um, and I guess this this is a little bit of a challenge to to those of you in the audience who think you're leaders, uh, and many of you are, and all of you can be. Uh, what is written in your job description is irrelevant. Um, what's written in your job description is um, what you do as a manager, uh, um, or how you tick things over day by day. Don't be confined by that. If you believe in this, um, then you have to raise your head and look beyond what's in writing. You have to raise your head and actually look a little bit beyond your own level, area of responsibility. Um, you have to be prepared to give time, give quality time um, for the greater good. And uh, if you do that, and those that are with you do that, then this will take on a life of its own. And the great news is that when people actually get that, and when they stand up and go beyond what might be thought to be uh, what they're responsible for and what they should do, uh, it adds up, and it adds up enormously. And then what happens is it succeeds. And when it succeeds, the benefits come back to where you are. 
and to your business. And that's the potential that exists, I think, within this framework. Is the framework is just some bits of words on bits of paper. It's the people uh, that will matter here. But I sense that the people like what's there, um, but you have to really bring it to life and make it work. And if you do, um, it will succeed and you will succeed. And in the end, in my view, that's the measure of a leader. Uh, not someone who just does what they're meant to do, but someone who does what they're meant to do and then stands up and does more because they know it's the right thing to do. Thank you.